Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sharon Dickey from Warracle, and thank you very much for coming along to this Warracle and People's Postcode Lottery webinar. Um, what we're going to discuss today is serverless for enterprise, which is a pretty popular topic. We've been around it a few times, but uh, it keeps growing and, and people keep getting interest in terms of different areas in this space. And we're delighted today to be joined um, with People's Postcode Lottery. So you'll find that it's quite a um, hands-on approach today. All of the people involved have been quite integral in terms of quite a lot of different implementations of serverless um, within enterprises. And so um, hopefully there'll be a lot of information and top tips that you'll be able to take away from this. Um, we're going to kick off um, to start with with uh, Warracle's Mike Wharton and he's going to talk through um, a little bit more about the you know why serverless and the environments that we've taken it into and then we're going to hand over and talk um, and let People's Postcode Lottery talk with uh, Craig, Ross and Ismail to talk about um, more detail about the implementation and the strategy and the key learnings um, within People's Postcode Lottery. Um, in terms of the running order, what we'll do is we'll start, as you see here, we'll start with Mike and go through Craig, Ross and Ismail. We will leave time at the end, hopefully, for um, a QA. and a you don't, you don't need to wait till the end, so if you see at the bottom of your screen the Q&A button, then click on that at any time and I'll come back at the end and uh, go through and ask as many questions as we possibly can. So I genuinely hope you get a lot out of today. Please ask questions at any time. Um, and if you've got any comments that you want to bring up, then you can just send me a chat um, via this as well. So we're gonna not spend any more time. Um, I'm gonna hand over straight away to Mike Wharton um, to kick off today's discussions. Thank you, Sharon. Um, so a quick introduction to myself and Warracle. So my name is Mike Wharton. I'm one of the co-founders and CTO of Warracle. Um, Warracle are one of the, the, the largest um, enterprise focused digital developers in the UK covering app, web and integration services. Uh, about 150, I think it's actually slightly higher now, maybe closer to 170 people across London, Glasgow, Edinburgh and Dundee. Um, we're UK-based capability and we deliver for enterprise clients internationally, so that's across the UK um, and also uh, further overseas. Um, we're, we're credible, we have a great track record, we've been going for I think you know, 13 years now, um, that work has been going for, you know, financially robust um, and a stable company. Um, we, we focus on long-term relationships with enterprise clients such as PPL. Um, we're delighted to be uh, having the opportunity today to present alongside um, our friends at PPL. So, just to talk about serverless. So, um, what, what, what does serverless mean? So, put simply, it's a cloud computing model where we no longer think about servers and networking and infrastructure and um, co-location. We adopting a model where the cloud provider um, dynamically manages those resources, those compute resources, to match the needs of the applications that we run. Now, this is a change in mentality because it removes any notion of that underlying hardware, and instead, the application code uh, and the compute time required to run that application code become the units of value. That's what you buy, effectively. Um, and, and that's really important because when we think about a large enterprise um, production stack, everything from all the hardware and the data centers and all that networking and infrastructure, the only part that actually delivers value for the business is that application code, that really thin layer that sits on the top that runs the business application and the business logic, whatever that, that business logic and whatever industry that is in, that is where the value is. And serverless allows us to align our cost model to that value model, and that, that's really important. So, on to costs. Now, big enterprises, no surprise, spend egregious and outrageous amounts of money on big infrastructure, um, whether that's on-prem or um, across multiple data centers around the world, it's hugely expensive undertaking. Now, if we can align our workload to this new operating model where the unit of value, instead of being 
um, or, or it is aligned with the unit of cost. So the unit of cost, instead of being a server in a data center somewhere in Delaware in the US, um, the unit of cost is the compute time required to run our valuable application. That's a massive shift in, in, in mentality and huge costs can come off the back of that. So this is a quote here on the right um, from uh, uh, one of my peers in um, a retail bank who said that a move to serverless has shifted IT costs by two decimal places. Now I'll, I'll, um, I'll point out that that was for a very specific use case and a very specific project. So I'm no way suggesting that um, a two orders of magnitude is um, you know, what we'll always see by shifting to a serverless model, but that's an example of just quite how significant and how stark um, the change can be. From um, one of the, the, the biggest challenges with a large infrastructure where you're managing everything from the application layer all the way down to the hardware, you know, deploying and route to live and managing all that infrastructure, that's incredibly expensive and it's incredibly tough to provision and adapt as market changes require. And serverless really helps with that. Okay, great. So if we understand what serverless, what benefits serverless can bring to a large enterprise, now what? How do we approach this? So let's, let's talk about what rolling out this new computing model within your enterprise let's talk about and think about a little bit of what about what that looks like and how that might work now i've um i've put together the these next few slides based on some conversations that i have had um with various people throughout industries who have through various industries who've rolled out serverless within their industry. Uh, and the, the, this, this talk that I want to go through with you now is um, some of the learnings that I've taken from um, those talks. So uh, this, this quote here from Simon Wardley um, is quite an interesting quote. It's maybe on slightly more on the extreme side, where he says in 2008, if, you weren't, if your CIO wasn't talking about cloud, and they dismiss it, then fire them. And in 2018, if they're not talking about serverless, then fire them again. That's maybe a little bit extreme, but the sentiment is certainly something I can agree with in terms of this is really what we should be thinking about in uh, IT, in enterprise IT infrastructure. This is really should be the direction of travel. So deploying with an enterprise. So let's set the scene. Uh, let's imagine you're a CIO or a CTO of a a large enterprise, whether that's in retail, whether that's in uh, travel or, or finance or energy or whatever that is, what are the challenges and barriers that we're going to encounter from, from a, a, a human side, as well as from um, an organizational side in order to roll this out? So this, this is a, a kind of a different, different way to look at it. So let's start with the, uh, the easy one, which is developers. So this is uh, moving to serverless, serverless is very often it's a very easy sell to, for developers, assuming that they're up for learning new things. Now, if your developers aren't up for learning new things, then I would say you've probably got an entirely different issue that, that, that needs solved. Um, but it, you know, in every time that we've encountered this and we've started to roll this out and we started to experiment with this in new environments, it's always been a very easy sell to get devs on board. Um, it's an interesting proposition because everything that we develop should have value. Um, we have small, succinct units of functionality. They are called functions, literally, um, that can be described in a single Jira ticket. Um, and that Jira ticket can even include a QA environment for uh, QA and testing self-service. That nice self-containedness makes development faster and easier because you haven't got um, you know, you haven't got so many people all, all kind of interweaving on the same on the same code base. It's extremely quick to provision infrastructure and to get something running, and this just really makes things go much faster at the beginning of the project and also throughout the project. Um, and it's great for proof of concepts. So you can spin something up, test it, push it into production environment or into a live environment, whether or not it's a production environment or not, and test and uh, iterate on that. Um, loads of off-the-shelf stuff 
Um, very easy to spin up new things and integrate. It's a very batteries included environment. Um, things like file upload, video transcoding, FTP, auth logging, etc. You know, they're all available off the shelf. Um, so things like logging and monitoring systems that are always a bit, you know, all that kind of um, behind the scenes plumbing that you need to put into uh, a large project is kind of already there for you. So you spend less time on those chores and more time on delivering the features and the value. Um, things like define, so, so jump back one. Things like uh, define triggers and queues and event streams. These are all just further tools that reduce dev time. Um, so we spend less time on that kind of stuff and more time on building the cool stuff which we all want to build. Um, things like Terraform and cloud, uh, cloud formation infrastructure as code allow us to keep our infrastructure and architecture in a Git repo and makes it very easy to spin up environments and deploy things using uh, CI pipelines and integration testing becomes much, much faster as well because we can replicate a production environment um, as, you know, very, very quickly in terms of all the ancillary components and we can test against that and then we can deploy it to, into production when necessary. Um, so testing, um, how will testing uh, react to the, this kind of change in mentality? Well, very well actually is, is, is our experience in this. It's very useful because as I mentioned before, a single ticket can actually include the, um, the QA environment and we can spin up um, test environments with all the necessary test data alongside those to allow a really in-depth QA environment that, that is very true to what we can expect in production and makes testing a lot easier. Um, and the ability to spin up environments and turn them down at a whim, that's great, that's what we want. That makes things iterative, it makes things fast and it makes testing um, a lot easier. So InfoSec, uh, now in, in, obviously this varies hugely across in, industries. So InfoSec, in my conversations with info, information security in financial services, generally this was um, just a fairly easy problem to solve. So a lot of InfoSec will be acutely aware of the, the problems with managing your own infrastructure. Things like vulnerabilities, patching, OS updates, all that kind of stuff. Amazon or Microsoft are going to do all of that stuff way quicker than um, your IT team. And, that, and that's not um, any, any disrespect to any IT teams in enterprise. That's just um, they, they, they are so fast at um, getting the information and getting the, the vulnerabilities in um, that it's going to be a lot faster. And that, that's really very common um, security vulnerability with infrastructure. So it generally, it just reduces the amount of stuff InfoSec have to worry about. Um, and this then leads on to, to reducing costs and reducing the time spent on managing things like vulnerabilities in, in InfoSec. Um, one uh, tool that we found was really good was Sneak.io. Um, and that gives you complete visibility of the supply chain of libraries that you're using in your code base. And that's really just to um, give a degree of control and demonstrate that you have control over this aspect of your infrastructure. Uh, also, being able to do static analysis for your own code, very straightforward, um, very, very beneficial and very popular with InfoSec as well. So architecture, this, this one was kind of in, uh, interesting for me. Um, infra, in, infra architects obviously will, um, you know, could po very possibly sense this uh, as a threat and perceive what they will, uh, they, they will perceive that they are no longer required in this new architecture. But rather than remove the work that they were doing before in, in kind of a more traditional environment, it really just changes the kind of work and kind of what we need from our architecture teams. Now, obviously, they're not going to be provisioning VMs and managing VM scaling, but it's very important to have that oversight over the architecture of a platform because if not, then a big serverless farm can quite quickly become messy. Um, and you know, I've seen that in a number of environments. And once you're in that position, it's quite difficult to kind of find your way out. So you need to understand this and you need to have your architecture team uh, really um, thinking about this from the beginning and making sure that um, things don't get don't get a bit messy. Also, in terms of performance, um, cold starts and provision of concurrency are something that really needs to be thought about. 
uh, our friends at PPL will we'll talk a bit more about that um, a bit more about that later on. But cold starts and, and concurrency, that's that's something that that's um, you know it can can always be an issue in the serverless environment and needs to be taken into consideration. Um, scale bottlenecks. It's all very good and well having a serverless architecture that can that's elastic and it can scale due to incoming demand. But sooner or later, that architecture is going to be integrating with something that's legacy, whether or not that's a database or it's a payment processor or it's a third party API. Um, not all those things will scale to the same degree and that will create bottlenecks in your architecture. And that's something that needs to be thought about. Uh, and that's, that's, um, that's something that really falls on the architecture um, and solution design team. Of course, there'll be some hiccups. Control the messaging. Make sure that um, everybody knows that the, you know, how their uh, jobs will change in this new in this new world, and make sure that doesn't get out of control. So procurement. Well, there's really not much to tender. There are very few um, real players in this space in terms of serverless. The big ones being, of course, Azure and AWS. So the most common. Um, what I would say is certainly in some of the bigger enterprise that have maybe long-standing relationships with the huge IT resellers, um, you know, your sort of SATs, your IBMs, uh, and Oracle, et cetera, they will often try and push alternatives to kind of protect their, uh, to protect their business. Um, our understanding and our experience of those is their alternatives are really um, suboptimal um, compared to the, the latest, more modern offerings from Microsoft and AWS especially. There are likely to be some questions, and to be quite honest, very good questions and very um, sensible questions on vendor lock-in. Uh, vendor lock-in is definitely an issue that you know we have to think about, especially with um, an environment where there's so much available off the shelf. Uh, it, it, it's there's no simple answer to it. It's just something that needs to be considered, and you need to understand where your um, where your exposure to vendor lock-in lies and, and manage that accordingly. So then how do we transition to this new world? Well, very simply, take really small steps, lower risk, reduce flapping, um, do some do small things, do proof of concepts, start with integration services. Serverless um, as, a, as a model is really, really good at doing kind of uh, integration and orchestration layer. That's a good place to start because you can um, you allow the solution design team to find their feet, build confidence, and build things up as you go. And you can spin up new services and peel off endpoints from your legacy architecture, set them up behind an API gateway, and then route traffic to your, um, either do AB routing or route traffic uh, from your legacy architecture to your new architecture, um, and uh, manage that accordingly, and, and do, do it one at a time and very gradually. So effectively, you just chill a chunk up the bottom, containerize that, make it function, and deploy that in your serverless architecture. So thank you. Okay, so thanks very much, Mike. So Mike gave a quick intro there in terms of um, where we're going with the topic. And now I'm gonna hand over to Craig from People's Postcode Lottery, who we've been working with for just over a year now. And I guess in terms of why we do these topics together, well, we enjoy talking about the technology together and spend a lot of time working on it, obviously, but equally want to see the industry grow and get ideas off the industry and, and likewise share our um, experiences. So what Craig and his team's now gonna go in and talk about is the experiences uh, that People's Postcode Lottery have had with regards to migrating and, and moving on to a serverless architecture. So Craig, I'll hand it over to you. Hi, thanks, Sharon. Um, so for, for anyone that isn't aware of um, the People's Postcode Lottery, I'm sure most people are. Um, our brand is, is a, we're a really popular brand in the UK and um, uh, I'm sure people have seen our adverts on, on TV, radio uh, and also on social media. Um, but for those that, uh, that don't, um, we're a society-based lottery that, um, that exists uh, to generate um, a sustainable source of revenue for good causes. Um, uh, and we give 32% of uh, all revenue that we generate um, to good causes. Obviously people play because they, um, they want to win um, um, uh, to win the prizes that, uh, that we have as part of our prize plan. 
Um, but what you might not know um, is a bit more about uh, our software development team um, and our and our uh, serverless architecture. Um, so that's what we're uh, we're going to cover today in this uh, talk. So um, who am I? Uh, I'm Craig Simon. I lead the software development team. I've been with the People's Postcode Lottery about um, four years uh, now, and. Uh, I've been trying to help the uh, the postcode lottery move uh, from uh, on premise uh, with a traditionally component based architecture. We were using um, containers uh, on premise um, when I joined, um, and uh, we're uh, and then moving to a serverless uh, architecture, uh, which we can uh, Ross and Ismail are going to tell you a little bit more about in detail um, as we go further through the presentation. Um, so why did we choose uh, the People's Postcode Lottery um, to choose serverless as our default architecture for new services? So I'm, I'm not sure if, if you can imagine um, that, that running a, a, a calendar-based lottery um, results in a really uneven um, uh, seat compute uh, uh, needs um, for over the month. Um, but most people tend to get paid around about the end of the month and want to, uh, their uh, their um, payment for the lottery to be collected roughly uh, or when they get paid or there or thereabouts. Um, so we, we see a large spike in demand uh, for our compute needs um, around um, collecting payments. And then also um, when we run uh, our draw at the end of uh, each um, calendar month um, and publish uh, winners uh, uh, as and when the publish dates happen, um, there's also a, a, a large um, need for us um, uh, to scale up uh, from a compute uh, uh, wise. And it, uh, serverless seem to be a really good fit um, for us uh, from that scaling perspective, because largely uh, we were passing off the responsibility of scaling up um, uh, to, uh, to Amazon, who is our, uh, our cloud partner of choice um, uh, for, the, uh, for the lottery. Um, so I thought it would be useful to go through some uh, use potential use cases or good use cases for serverless. Um, so the uh, web app, static web apps are, are a really good um, choice uh, for um, serverless, as are um, uh, REST APIs. Um, data processing is another really good um, use case uh, for uh, for serverless, um, either in real time or for um, MapReduce chatbots, again, another um, great. Um, and uh, automation's uh, also a really great place to potentially start and dip your toe um, into uh, serverless and Lambda for automating um, bits of your uh, workflows um, and uh, data processing uh, as part of um, either your software deployments or uh, data enrichment, Any, anything like that is a, um, a, a great place to start. Um, uh, um, so that, uh, this is an, an architecture diagram um, of our uh, retail uh, website that, uh, that we have at the Postcode Lottery. Um, and if we uh, rewind um, six months ago, this diagram would look quite different. Um, uh, we had a very traditional architecture um, uh, with a, a monolithic um, uh, web application. And what we found um, uh, uh, a peak sale event last year around Christmas time um, was that our page load time um, spiked uh, massively. And uh, and after that event, um, uh, we thought, well, obviously we realized we lost some sales as a result of that. Um, some customers were frustrated and we thought, how could we use serverless on our website um, to prevent us from uh, losing sales and ensuring that we provide a consistent um, level of uh, service uh, to our customers uh, going forward. So uh, uh, we decided to put CloudFront in front of the website um, and also um, moved uh, to static, uh, statically generating um, all of our pages. And whenever we want um, to change uh, content, um, uh, we just go through a continuous deployment flow and update. Um, the version of the website um, and the, uh, so we're using a combination um, of Contentful as a CMS in Gatsby uh, to allow us uh, to do that. And if we move on to the next um, slide, you can see um, that we, here if we compare the performance of before and after, um, 
uh, of our home page, um, we've essentially reduced the page load time by um, a second, and we've got some some additional targets um, uh, to be able to reduce uh, even more. And, and what this, what I haven't also shared here, is uh, is also moving to the uh, to a continuous deployment flow has also um, allowed us to deploy software to the website and make changes um, far more frequently. And uh, it's also reduced an awful lot of pain um, because we do it more often. It's like the exercise, uh, the more you do it, the easier it gets. Um, and that's really helped us. We, uh, the team uh, are now able to get through um, work much faster uh, than we were before. And that's largely down to a continuous deployment approach and also um, uh, serverless uh, and the investment that we made in making sure we've got the, the right level of tests um, and, uh, and a, a delivery of a, approach where we, uh, we can do canary deployments um, and test out every change in, uh, in production and, and rollback if we see uh, anything adverse. Um, and one of the other use cases um, that I think Ross um, and Ismail are going to cover in, in quite a bit more detail is that we're building uh, essentially uh, REST APIs and serv services um, using um, a mixture of Lambda um, and API Gateway. Um, and then we're using um, Amazon serverless um, database offerings. So here you can see that we're using DynamoDB, um, uh, but equally uh, we could also use um, Aurora uh, and uh, and within the Lambda, we can generate events either through um, Kinesis or any number of events and have a distributed uh, event-based architecture um, in our uh, back-end uh, systems. Um, and uh, we also mentioned uh, the automation case. So this is, um, uh, we use Security Hub um, to alert us uh, when we deviate from best practice um, and in the stacks that we're creating. Um, and what we found with Security Hub uh, was uh, that it gives you an account number and an AWS ARN um, and, it, and not much else in terms of, the, of identifying an issue. So uh, we've taken to using Lambda um, to, uh, to pull out stack tag information to enrich um, each security finding so that, they're much, that it's much faster to figure out um, what the affected resource is. Um, and like this is just one of many different ways of using um, uh, serverless uh, um, to, to create automation flows uh, in AWS. So I'm going to introduce Ross. Um, Ross is a software developer in our payments team. Lovely. Thank you very much, Craig. Yes, I've been with the People's Post Laboratory for a couple of years now, working with broadly serverless technology in Amazon Web Services for that full duration. So a lot of the examples I'm going to touch on for the next few minutes are based in AWS, but much of that will be applicable across other cloud platforms like Azure as well. So ultimately, why would we choose serverless development? You may well be familiar with container-based solutions already and feel fairly comfortable with that typical development approach. So you may ask, why would it be worth investing the time to learn and build from the ground up serverless technology? And five key arguments spring to mind for me when that question is brought forward. First and foremost, Mike and Craig have already touched on this. The maintenance is solely the responsibility of the cloud provider. So we need not concern ourselves with provisioning servers or patching or upgrading those servers. Those responsibilities lie with the cloud provider and that allows us, the developers, to focus on the application layer code. Ultimately, the logic that's key to the business and delivers the most value to our customers. And with that, there's a greater degree of flexibility. Now, in terms of vertical scaling, how much CPU or memory resource we may wish to give to our code, we can choose that on the click of a button. And it's ultimately up to the cloud provider. To deliver that resource to us. And if we ever want to change it, it's just okay, we have options and in horizontal scalability that's done seamlessly under the hood without any intervention on our part. So typically you may design a serverless function to hold a single request. And then every time you want to submit batches of requests, you'll have simultaneous executions of your function handling each item independently. And the volume of requests you're sending as your input, irrespective of the size, will be met by scaling resources, either scaling outward or inward, entirely automatically under the hood. Now, if the responsibility for the hardware lies with the cloud provider rather than ourselves, you may then ask, how do we guarantee it's going to be available? How do we know that the systems are going to be reliable and serve our customers all the time. And ultimately, most solutions will redundantly store data across multiple different servers. 
and these servers will each keep each other in sync and make sure they've got the most up-to-date data, thereby if any single one of those servers goes down, the others can continue to operate and business runs as normal. And last but not least, the cost implications. With serverless, we're only charged for what we use. Less is more, they say, quite often in the serverless world. So we are not going to be charged for any unused capacity. It's really down to how much data we're manipulating and how long we're using the service for that ultimately decides our bills. Now, you may have many different serverless functions, each serving a small segment of part of a wider process. You may be interacting with some NoSQL tables in serverless, like DynamoDB that was mentioned before, or other features too. And you may ask, how do we tie all these different services together to build an entire service or an entire platform? Now, the answer to this in AWS is step functions, which is a form of defining state machines that can coordinate your different tasks, either in sequence or in parallel, or even asynchronously, if you happen to have a task that's going to take a considerable length of time to process. Now, flows, as I was describing earlier, typically will handle one individual request at a time. So good design practice would be to write your code and define your state machines to be processing individual requests or very small batches of requests. The reason for this, the functions have quite a low timeout. So taking Lambda from AWS as an example, their timeouts are currently 15 minutes and before that they were five minutes. So they are considerably small and we want to be able to guarantee that every request is going to be fully processed on time. So it's best practice, all the code is designed to handle a single execution and then the functions just scale out multiple executions if you're sending batches of requests as input to your system. Now, I think Mike touched on this earlier, you may well have bottlenecks that are third party services or legacy application code. And you may ask if I have theoretically an unbound number of executions of my logic, how do I handle bot these bottlenecks in the middle of the system? And ultimately best practice on that front would be to place a queue in front of the bottleneck service. That way your serverless architecture can scale as much as it needs and push all its messages into the queue. And the external bottleneck can churn away at its own pace and pop the messages at a rate that's comfortable for that service. So on the point of high availability, that sounds great if we can guarantee that services are going to be there for us when we need them. But what's the downside to this? Ultimately, if we're relying on multiple servers to stay in sync and to hold our data, then what happens if one of those servers goes down? Ultimately, the other servers continue to work as normal. So as far as we're concerned as the developers, it shouldn't impact our service. But there is one caveat to this. If the server, one server falls out of sync, it will not be aware, for instance, in a queue if messages have been popped from the queue. So the other two servers will continue to churn away, pop some messages off a queue for Lambda functions to consume. Then the third one that came unavailable will come back online and it may be unaware of what changes have taken place in its absence. So it'll resend the messages that were removed earlier by different servers. Now in this instance, consumers are going to see duplicate requests coming their way. And it's ultimately up to us as the developers to be designing these systems to handle those duplicates. There's no guarantee that the cloud provider will do this for us. We've had to handle this particular problem in numerous different places in the postcode lottery with different technology, including the simple queue service and step functions. And the best way to go around this is to be keeping a track of your requests in the NoSQL DynamoDB table. Uh, that way you can keep a track of which requests you've seen before, which state they're in, how far through their state, your state machine they've proceeded, and whether or not it would be safe to retry a request. So with that in mind, what's next for serverless technology? Craig touched on Aurora earlier, which is a serverless model for relational databases. This is a relatively new feature that came out a couple of years ago and has already proved hugely valuable to us at the People's Postcode Lottery. So could we expect more game changers like that to come our way soon? The honest answer is I'm not sure, but I would strongly advise keeping an eye for keynote sessions that are usually on an annual basis from the cloud providers. AWS reInvent being a fine example is taking place later this month. Existing services, like the step functions I touched on before, are continuing to grow and continuing to expand. They recently introduced a variation called Express Workflows, which allow us to process data in very quick workflows at a cheaper cost. And already we're applying that in numerous places to our benefit and keeping our costs down in the postcode lottery. Now with new services like those Express Workflows, Stack Overflow won't always have the answers. And quite often we need to be innovative and creative in the solutions we present. So be prepared to allocate a lot of time to technical spikes, to proof of concepts, 
and to knowledge sharing across your teams where you work and make sure that everyone's learning exactly what's fit for purpose in different use cases and what technologies are right for the problem you're trying to solve. And ultimately, at the Postcode Lottery, we are provisioning all of our server serverless technology through infrastructure as code. We're using a project called the AWS CDK, the Cloud Development Kit, and the more support that the Cloud Development Kit has for building and deploying serverless technology, the more we can do at the Postcode Lottery with that framework. So that's a fine example of many projects out there that are open source, which will help the serverless community. If you have any suggestions for new features or identify any bugs that could potentially be fixed to improve our experience, I'm sure those contributions from either yourself or someone you know would be warmly welcome. And I'll hand over to Ismail, who's going to cover some tips from our serverless experiences at the Postcode Lottery. Hello. Um... Thanks, Ross. It's not going to take much longer, already half past two, but uh, it's only going to be 10 more minutes, hopefully. So I'm a senior software developer here at uh, PPL. I've been working in PPL for almost three years. And as Ross has said, we're going to talk a bit uh, our top tips or lessons learned from using AWS at PPL. So the first, the main um, problem that people used to have in, the, in the Lambda, it's uh, on serverless, is what's called the cold start. Um, to understand a bit the cold start, before I go on the other uh, topics, um, it's the, basically the time that takes for the cloud provider to find your code, stick it into a container, and bootstrap the runtime. So this a part for the AWS to optimize and a part for you to optimize. So for the part that uh, you have to optimize, if, if you suffer cold start, that let's say it's not that apparent, you, you might suffer it in some cases, but uh, it's less uh, of a problem. We find out not to be as much as a problem as we have thought it will be. But the main thing is uh, keep it small and simple, so avoid it importing big framework, frameworks in your, in your lambdas, avoid uh, too many libraries, too many imports, avoid big code, basically, because it will take more time to move that code across. Um, choose your language. So uh, prefer Python, Node, or Go, or other languages that have a smaller footprint and the runtime, like Java and .NET are great programming languages, but they do have a bigger front, front um, footprint on the runtime. And if you still have the problem of cold starts, AWS uh, has provided, I had added last year, uh, something that is called a provision concurrency. It basically keeps some lambdas for you warm so that you don't need to, you pay a bit extra, but you don't need to suffer the cold start. And the other alternative is to architect for it. Basically, you can, you can be asynchronous on your on your lambdas and you use web codes or whatever. So it's not really much of a time. There are options out there. When or if, not, not if, but when you move uh, some of your services over or the full services to, um, to serverless, you will start to find that your architecture will be something like those pictures, probably more complicated, but some services will be as simple as a Lambda and an S3 bucket, or maybe an API gateway in front of it. So my, my top tip is uh, learn those core services. It, they might depend on your, on your company on what, what your company does, but uh, they will more than certainly imply a Lambda, DynamoDB, S3, API gateway, and SQS. AWS has a lot of training material around it, uh, so go and, and, and explore it. They have different levels of training material, go and explore them and learn a bit about them because it will help you. Um, start with event-driven um, architectures. In the future, that will help you go what's called flow-driven architectures or even evolutionary architectures, but start with event-driven. Don't worry about all the magic of being able to analyze streams of data events. Just start with the simple, even driven and, and you will be able to move forward later. And design for failure, it's important. Um, so put queues when you have to, you know, when, when just in case, when you're getting in and out of services or when you have, you need to throttle to external providers and things like that. 
set alarms, uh, set retries. Lambda does have come with some retries. Um, set functions do have some retry logic that you can configure and handle handle throttling because you will you will find it. You know, when you are scaling fast, uh, at some point, yeah, AWS has some limits, so you need to handle them. Coming to the or continue with the lesson learned. Um, from my point of view, um, and everybody's, I guess, is free to have a different point of view. Uh, well, they are free, actually. When, from, from my point of view, you should be able to use serverless always. Now, there are cases through the batch processing or long batch processing that might be better suited, suited for, or they will be better suited for um, EC2 instances, so ser traditional servers, or even MapReduce or something like that. But most of your problems can be either done in serverless in those 15 minutes that you have, or 10, you just think about 10 minutes, or, a, or you can set it with a step functions. You can set it in, in a set of steps. So think about first doing it in serverless, and if it doesn't work, it, it's quite easy to move that code to a container or whatever. It's quite easy. So you, at least you are getting some metrics, and it doesn't really take much of your time. In terms of uh, next next point, proof of concept, uh, one of the benefits also of, of serverless is the ability of um, create like going from an idea to a proof of concept, not only of your code but of your architecture also. In 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 a few days, uh, you you can start a Monday with an idea, and if you really want, and uh, you you can have by Friday a proof of concept with a really rough and ready architecture. And you can then prove it even with some customers if you are, if you want to do it, uh, but you can prove if that's gonna work and, and learn from it. You don't need to spend months of development to validate uh, an idea. If you uh, have uh, need to have relational databases, there was also the idea, the idea to, or the problem that uh, the database connections are, are finite, or is a, a, a number that you can have. But uh, now in serverless, you can use either Aurora serverless with a data API or RDS proxy. If, if you have a Postgres uh, 10 or MySQL, you can use RDS proxy. Um, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Like the, those, those services do, do their job pretty well. And it's quite complex to manage connections otherwise. So that's my recommendation. Um, external APIs, already Ross has uh, talked about that. Um, put the queue in front of the Lambda that is going to talk with, to your external API. Your uh, third party provider will thank you for that because otherwise you might knock their systems down. Um, now, distribute your code, your share code as libraries. That will help testing and also help sharing code across the company or the, the departments. Um, we also recommend uh, dockerizing your local environments. We don't have that yet, but we have suffered the consequences of those. So do it early. It's not that complicated and it will save you a lot of, uh, it works in my machine, but it doesn't work in Lambda or the other way around. Um, move to continuous deployment. If you can, uh, from my point of view, continuous delivery is not good enough anymore. Um, it's, it's better than not continuous anything, but <laughs> it's not as good as continuous delivery. And, and from this part of the lesson learned, go and pick up uh, your, your favorite framework for infrastructure as code, but do it, you use Terraform, CDK, whatever, but the benefits outweigh the cost. It's, it will save you a lot of time. Um, then also, I recommend to like AWS in each of their services, they have a section that's called the best practices. Go and read them and apply them. They are to really good practices. Not, don't ignore them. We did ignore them initially and then find out that we should have applied them. Uh, we, we, we learn pretty quickly on that. Uh, then also AWS has some hard and soft limits. Learn the hard limits. Um, they are in their documentation. Learn them because otherwise you will learn it the hard way. Um, and raise the soft one. It's okay to raise the soft ones. It's not, I mean, have a think about it before you do it. But normally the AWS soft limits are quite low. 
Um, I'm moving to the next uh, recommendation, throttling. Um, if you have a problem with throttling that you will have, if, if you are scaling up quite fast, uh, retry it slower. So take your, make, leave AWS time to scale up. Uh, AWS uh, will has a hard limit of 500 new lambdas per minute. So it will only give you 500 new lambdas in a minute. And you know, that might not be good enough, uh, big enough for, for your solution. Um, quotas, so at some limits, you say you know, they, we're scaling up, like AWS will scale up your, your, your infrastructure like 500 uh, lambdas a minute at, at a time. Um, so it's good actually to add some limits um, or quotas on your APIs because you don't want a raw, raw user to you know, spam your API because it will cost you a lot of money also. Um, and uh, the other thing, the other side, side of the coin, uh, set alarms or cost budgets because it will uh, help you also understand where the money is because there, there will be a lot of services so it, it comes yeah it's much more complicated to manage in that sense so what it takes me to the next uh, recommendation it's a uh, tax um, plan your tagging strategy at the beginning uh, one one thing to know on that is that uh, all tax and values cannot be deleted so when you're planning your strategy do it in an environment that you can tear down you, you can do that in aws so it's quite simple I plan it there and then apply it across your um, in, infrastructure so that will mean that you'll be able be able to visualize what's costing you when how and all that and then you can start to optimize the things that are costing you more money or the, the things that needs optimized what it moves me it, it takes me to the next step the net things net think that it's a um, observability observability is key when you have that many we services all across the, the board you know um so enable x-ray learn to use uh, cloudwatch and remember cloud trail it's a uh, talking about aws man fairly sure so we'll have the same things cloud trail it's a great helper on finding deployment issues and when things a bit odd go to cloud trail and see what's going on it will tell you what and who did what um, optimization leave time for it at the end or you don't don't pre-optimize that's one of the, the beauties also for serverless that you can you know say i put a lambda with one gigabyte and see how it goes you get it running and then when you, you got your code running and then you can optimize you can do something like a aws lambda power tuning i will tell, tell you um, a good cost estimates like if you want you want to optimize for cost or you want to optimize for speed and most time optimizing for speed it will be cheaper it sounds weird but you might want a bigger instance because it's less it takes less time so it's cheaper for you so it's crazy but it happens and last but not least vendor lock-in we we'll already talked about that um plan for it or accept it there is no other thing we we decided to go with aws because it brings a lot of extra benefits. If we don't want it to be a vendor locked in, we will need to make a lot of compromises across the board. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ismail, Ross, and, and Craig. Um, I hope that's been useful to you. It's kind of a face that you don't normally see um, of a company in terms of what goes on in the background. And I hope you've seen that there's quite a lot of detail there in terms of what's driving this, the very public services that you see, what's in the background. So thanks very much for, um, to People's Postcode Lottery for sharing that with us. Um, I've got a few questions. If anyone else has got questions that they want to add, then please, um, by all means, add them to the Q&A. Um, if Craig, uh, Ross and Ismail and Mike want to come back on so that I can just throw in these questions and you can decide who to take them between you. Um, but we'll kick off with, Kind of a starting point of um, if someone was starting off for the first time, um, where would you recommend they start when they start their journey with regards to serverless? Who wants to take that? I'm happy to take that one. 
Okay, go and on. I think it's quite a good question for me since I was in this very position when I joined the Postcode Lottery a couple of years ago. So I'm going to go based mostly off experience in answering this one. I, there's two different avenues in terms of development for the software. I would suggest, in the case of Amazon at least, starting with Lambda functions. They're going to be core to pretty much any service you're building with serverless technology. And just doing a hello world example of a Lambda function in whichever language of your choosing, I think would be a really good starting foundation just to see how to build, test, and deploy an individual function in isolation. And from there, you can expand to see Lambda's wider functionality. But there's also a second avenue I would suggest, which would be to explore the certifications that the likes of AWS offer. There's plenty of learning resources online, and many of them offer certifications off the back of training courses just to give you the chance to develop your theoretical understanding of cloud development and then prove that understanding with exams. So, Ross, let me just take that a little bit further. Who do you think, um, what kind of organisations or kind of uh, infrastructure should be considering serverless if they're not already? Okay, uh, it's a very, uh, it's going to sound like a very vague answer, but I think it's applicable to most industries. Certainly, it's a great cost saving exercise in the long term, albeit there will be a lot of investment again in the beginning to learn how to use serverless technology and to take the time to replace systems with serverless technology. But in the long run, it's a great cost saving exercise when you're no longer having to maintain uh, hardware going forward. Uh, it's difficult to pin it to any one industry because, like I say, that is broadly applicable across most sectors. I would say there'd be very limited cases I can imagine where that wouldn't be a suggested approach. Yeah, cool. Okay, okay. that's great. So um, here's a question. I don't know who wants to take this. It might be Ismail, but um, you can let me know. Um, why did you choose AWS as your platform of choice? Um, I, I think, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I think I might be better um, placed okay. uh, to choose that. So um, the, uh, as a group of lotteries, um, uh, th there's five lotteries as part of the, uh, the postcode lottery group across Europe. Um, and it was a it was a group wide decision um, uh, that uh, we decided um, that we wanted to move away from uh, from an on premise um, environment and enable us to start running uh, workloads um, in the cloud. And it was actually a business problem um, that we had in one of our, our, our other lotteries um, that was actually the, the key to unlocking that decision to move to the cloud. Um, uh, the Dutch Postcode Lottery had a TV show um, that had like a bingo um, game element to it. Um, and essentially they DDoSed um, the private data center every time they tried to run this game um, and nobody could manage to collect their bingo numbers. So we volunteered to build that in AWS because we'd been uh, lobbying and pushing to move to AWS and, uh, and as part of that um, uh, work we, we managed to, to build an app um, in AWS using a serverless build approach that could uh, return um, the customer's bingo numbers in under 100 milliseconds with over um, uh, 50,000 requests per second being loaded um, uh, on the API uh, and, and, that, and, and that success was really the thing that unlocked um, moving to the cloud for the, the whole organization. Great, brilliant example. Thanks very much, Craig, and thanks for remembering all those numbers as well. So I've got two questions here that you may want to carry on with, and one leads on from the other. So what were the, you perhaps mentioned some of these of the goals and objectives um, when you picked, uh, when you went on the serverless architecture, but also a follow on from that is, um, as a result of making that decision, have you seen good return on investment by making that move? So I think I can um, might be best place to answer that one again. So, like our our main goal was around uh, like so we sp um, spent an awful lot of money, like most enterprises, um, on uh, architecture. And if we were to look at our uh, on infrastructure, sorry, and if we looked at our um, our usage of that architecture, it was very uneven. Um, but if you averaged out across the month, uh, we would have a very low um, CPU and memory utilization um, on. Uh, our infrastructure spend um, and it was really uh, really our, our goal um, w was uh, to spend less uh, on our infrastructure so uh, to enable us um, uh, to give more money um, to good causes um, and to build infrastructure uh, that would um, scale and meet our customers demands um, we look, as a group, we look to, to spin up a new lottery um, roughly every um, 18 months uh, to three years. Um, and if we build a serverless um, 
uh, lottery platform, um, the cost of for a new lottery starting up um, will scale um, as they grow. Um, and, and that was really what, one of the main goals. Uh, we wanted a platform that would grow with our needs and essentially we pass um, our uh, growth needs and, res uh, and responsibilities to AWS uh, to handle for us from a scaling perspective. Okay, and, and it has been a good strategy in terms of the return on investment for the company? Yeah, so far it's been great. Um, uh, we've so we were taking days to collect money um, from on some of our payment methods, and we've managed to cut the same batch runs down um, to um, single digit hours um, uh, by embracing serverless uh, and, and the concurrency. That, that uh, now it's our providers um, that we're using um, that are the limit um, to how quickly we can, uh, we can collect money. From, um, uh, as, as part of our um, payment runs processes uh, and also I, I think you, you saw the use case in our, our website and where uh, like we want to continue reducing our page load time um, and uh, we've seen more people interacting and signing up as a result of reducing our, our page load time which um, is in line with what you would expect um, the slower your website the more people that leave frustrated and um, without having um, purchased so yeah it's been it's been great for us Great. Okay, fab. So a um, couple of other questions here. We'll try and fit them in. Um, interesting question because it's becoming quite topical at the moment of why did you choose serverless rather than Kubernetes? Who wants to take that one? I'm not sure if uh, Ross and Ismail were with us, but we did actually try Kubernetes. Um, and we, like we aren't a huge development team and, uh, and there wasn't an awful lot out there. Um, to support or like to give you a, like a template of here's how you run Kubernetes. I mean, we did have a go at it and it was actually really difficult. Um, and uh, so we tried, we piloted both approaches um, and found that we could write software uh, or solutions and provide business value faster. Um, at the time when we started our, our um, re trying to pay down some technical debt in our ex legacy platforms um, you know, using a serverless approach. Okay, okay, that's cool. Um, then some quite specific questions in terms of, um, do did you experience any cold start problems? As well, would be good to answer that. We one. have experience, especially with uh, Aurora serverless. Uh, we did experience um, some cold starts, like if, in only in our test, because uh, we basically uh, so. One thing that AWS does it when, when you're not using a database, it basically is it, it put it into a, a bucket. Just put it into like compress it, put it into a bucket and forget about it. So when you need to spin it up, it needs to go and grab that database, put it into a server, and spin up the server and do all of that. So it, it takes it actually doesn't take that long, but it takes enough time uh, for yeah, for throttling is starting to happen. But uh, what that teach us is to architect around it. So we, what we then added it was a back off the try logic to basically assume that the services might be down and might take some time to, to, to get up. And yeah, that, that was mainly the, the main problem that we had. But okay. yeah, it was solved in architecture, so no, not really. Okay, cool. So we've got one question here that I'm gonna put to Mike if I can, which is, um, how important, in terms of what you've seen across some of our other implementations, how important do you, or how important or how, how popular now is the move to serverless or Kubernetes with regards to an overall digital strategy? Yeah, good question. So I think that in, certainly in some of the more nimble financial services accounts, so this is retail banking, um, it's, it's definitely playing a, a part in the strategy going forward. Um, what I would say is it tends to be focused on integration and orchestration layer because those are things that often need done as part of um, releasing new products and propositions. And serverless is such an excellent fit for that. It's kind of a no-brainer. Um, so I think that um, in some of the larger enterprise accounts that I'm familiar with, where they're not using it in Angular yet, it's on their strategy and it's on their roadmap. And it, it's only um, because either they haven't released the proposition or the program yet, 
or because they're um, they're taking a very measured approach and these things are kind of still in development. Some of the routes live and release pipelines for certainly for big banks, they take a long time, um, and also bigger banks, they, they can take a long time um, because they're very focused on things like security and uh, reliability, which are, you know, of course, what, what we ho would hope they would be. Uh, but the downside of that is, so you know, moving to a new technology like this um, can take can take some time. Um, but yeah, we're seeing it. Um, we're seeing it a lot, and um, we're seeing it now as being the the, the default um, the default platform of choice going forward for new developments. But it'll take a while for this to filter down as they start to put over all their existing real estate and their existing infrastructure. Okay, great. Thank you. Guys, we're, we're kind of at time, and so I don't want to run everyone over. Um, if there are any additional questions that anyone wants to send in, then please send them through to Heather, and she'll make sure that the team gets them and tries to get an answer back to you. Um, I would like to thank you all for attending today and, and taking your time out to listen to us, and especially thank um, the team from People's Postcode Lottery, Craig, Ross, Ismail, and of course, Mike from Oracle, um, for taking their time to spend some time and talk through this topic. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Look out for more topics. We'll no doubt revisit some like this again or, or go around different topics and um, would love to see you back at these. So thank you very much, everyone.